Hello, my name is Dr. Scott Young with Hearing Solutions Centers. And today we're going to talk to you about the middle ear. Coming right up. So when you have this middle ear, I want to show you a different way that we're going to do our videos today. Thank you first to Audigy Group. Audigy Group builds these really cool, quick videos. Now they have some sound in the background. I'm gonna mute the sound so I can yap over the top of it. But you're gonna see this over the whole screen and you will just have a quick view of what the ear does. So our first video here is called the middle ear wave. And in the middle ear wave, what you're going to see is that sound comes into the ear it hits the eardrum and the eardrum starts to vibrate in there. So she's going to play this a, probably a second time. So as we do that, the middle ear waves and has that sound that comes in. And then it's different in, in different parts of the eardrum. So high pitches go to one spot and lower pitches go toward more toward the middle. Then it, it goes into a piston motion. So the sound is going in and pushing through to the inner ear. Now we're not going to talk about the inner ear at all. We're just going to deal with the middle ear. Now that's when everything works perfectly. And so we're going to talk about this thing called otitis. Otitis means disease of the ear. So whether it's, no, that doesn't mean exactly where, okay? Otitis media means middle. Otitis externa is our first one. And the otitis externa is of the outer ear. Now, most people, before we do this video, most people think of the outer ear as just this out part out here. So for instance, if you had an ear piercing, and I had one of those in college, and on my ear piercing in college, if I had infected ears, it would have otitis externa, but you can also have an infected ear canal. Let's say you were using a Q-tip. So I'm going to show you this little next video right here. And as you had a Q-tip, what would happen is it would redden up and actually swell. So you have to be super careful, guys, of what you do to your ears. And I see people use bobby pins, Q-tips, I mean, all these crazy things to fix this. And guys, don't do it, okay? Don't do it. <clears throat> the reality is that when you do that to your ears, you easily could cause problems. So, you know, people will take a, a bobby pin, they'll take, now some of you won't know what that is, but. I just want you to think of a paper clip and then they kind of, uh, you know, kind of straighten that little puppy out and they'll get in there, scratch their ears. Ear canal, the ear canal is supposed to make ear wax. Now, some people make more, some people make less. Just like some people have oily skin or combo skin and other people have very dry skin. And, and sometimes your ear will make more or less. Now you can mess with your ear by screwing around your eardrum or your ear canal. And here's the funniest thing. I had this, and it sounds funny, but I'm not trying to be rude here, but I'll tell you what this actually, this physician actually said. I'm first year out of, out of college. It was uh, second year. So my first year after my residency and this uh, ear physician wrote this in the, in the report, he said, the patient had a misadventure with a Q-tip. And I had to sit there like, what a misadventure? What do you mean? What he, she did is that she was playing around with her ears and she told me the story and the, her kid walked up and said, Hey mommy, boop, and popped the, that thing right through the eardrum. It can happen. It can be an issue. And so what happens first off is that you can cause an infection in the ear canal. So that's, otitis externa. Now in otitis externa, you're probably going to have to have ear drops or some type of, of antibiotic cream or drops that will go on to that ear canal. And your general physician is actually very good at handling that kind of stuff. So you're going to get those ear drops. You definitely want to use the whole bottle. I, I see this all the time as an audiologist. And, and by the way, every medical professional actually interacts with this. Whether it's a physical therapist 
who's dealing with an infected leg, you know, with a person, you know, after they've gotten out of surgery and they've had an infection and they're not taking all their medication. You know, if you have 10 days of medication, take all of your medication all the way through. Don't stop when you think you're sort of better. And that's what happens with otitis externa. If you don't use all your medication, you could have this reappear and then it keeps getting worse and worse. So then once you've cleaned out your ear, meaning like you're, you're not having that redness, that irritation, that hurting problem, then, and you've used all your medication, then you're okay. Okay. Just don't go back to what you used to be doing. Now, Let's move and shift a little bit to what's called otitis media. Otitis disease, media means middle, so that's disease of the middle ear. So let's watch our little video right here, and you have disease of the middle ear. Now, if you notice, there's a little <coughs> spot on the bottom that gets, that uh, fills up with fluid. So first off, what we have there, so we're going to, we're gonna come back to this video and I'm gonna show you it twice. So as you're watching me right here, so basically there's on the, the top of the mouth, we have an opening and that inlet is very close to the nasal passages. Now I have lots of nasal problems. And so what happens is that you can be maybe a centimeter or a few millimeters away from where the nose, the nose drains out into the hard palate, soft palate areas, depends on where your, your anatomy is. And then it flows right over to this opening and that opening goes, gets, gets infected and then it closes off. Now that opening when it closes off is going to, is going to create a vacuum pressure in the, in the middle ear space and that vacuum pressure when it goes farther and farther. Now what will happen to you is you feel like I need to like open up my ear and, and you'll, you'll want to do this. Now, one of the things that this happened is called a Valsalva maneuver started in World War II. So what you would do is you hold your nose and I'm not going to do this because it hurts my nose with my no nasal problems, but you hold your nose and blow through and you'll pop out your ears. Now, physicians, actually good ear, nose, and throat physicians will actually tell you to do this maybe five or 10 times a day. You're just trying to pop out that pressure problem. It's because that, that space that has the ability that, you know, have to have, to have to have the regulation will be closed off. And as that closed off area happens, fluid will fill up. It sucks it out from the middle ear uh, cavities around it. And so it fills up with this fluid. And first off, it's a serious, a serious level fluid. So it's just a clear fluid. It's not infected. But if it gets worse and worse and stays in there, it'll have an orange or, I mean, excuse me, a green or a yellow tint to it, depending upon what type of bacterial infection is going on in the ear. Now, so what they do is that you'll have this fluid in there and then what you'll have is a pretty significant hearing loss. Now, if you have perfect hearing up at zero decibels across the board, we'll talk about that in another video, at zero decibels, you might have a drop of 30 decibels. In perceptual terms, that's a 300% worse hearing. You're gonna say, I'm deaf. <coughs> I hear this all the time. I'm deaf, I can't hear anything. The reality is, is that you have what we even just call, and I, audiologists say this, it's a mild hearing loss. Now it, now we have correctly changed those terminology from when I was in grad school to educationally significant hearing loss. So a kid who has an ear infection, I mean, she's gonna have a lot of troubles hearing the speech information around her. So she's gonna miss out, uh, whether she's missing out on speech sounds, if she's had it all of her life, she might have delays of the th, you know, all those different sounds that she can't hear. So she doesn't know how to hear to say them. So that becomes part of the issues. And, and we have that, uh, that educational problem. This is a situation that an ear physician will go in and do uh, a couple of things. First off, I'm going to show you the first thing. Sometimes the eardrum will perforate, <coughs> excuse me, perforate. So you'll see that hole in there. And what happens is that hole, 
that hole sets up and, and then just floats out all the material. And so you'll see this, a kid wakes up and there's, there's blood a little bit and some of the fluid, it's kind of a, a different color fluid that's draining out of the ear. So that kid has had a perforation. Now, frankly, the perforation hurts, um, but they actually feel relief right away and they can hear and you think everything's fine. No, if it's too big of a perforation, it needs to have tympanoplasty. We'll show you that in a second. But when that perforation is small, now if it's a very small hole, the body will kind of grow over it with this fibrous material and just fix it itself, okay? But you kind of need to have a good ear physician take care of that uh, to just verify that it looks okay. And audiologists can help you as well with that, just to verify it looks good. Now, if you have problems with a kid or even an adult who has a problem with the, the eardrum, they're, they're filling up with fluid and they can't hear, <coughs> they will have this little ear tube. And you see this little green tube and it's placed in there. They will go in and suction out. And that's what you're kind of seeing there. They'll suction out all the fluid. So it's like a little vacuum that in the ear, you're sucking out all the fluid. So let's watch this again. So we have, they will do what's called a myringotomy. Excuse me, we're gonna flip over here to this one. So they'll do a myringotomy, which is a cut, and then they'll put this little uh, tube in there. Now they can do two different types of tubes. One is a permanent and one, the other one is a temporary tube. Now, if it's a plastic tube, it's more of a temporary one, which means that there's three skin layers and it will just kind of, you know, push its way out and then fall out, fall out on the pillow kind of thing. If it's more of a permanent tube, that's a metally tube. That means that someone's had lots and lots of ear infections. So don't think permanent's forever. It, it, it may come out after a few years. It might stay in there for a very long time. So it kind of depends upon which way that physician is looking at it to help take care of that for you. Now, the tympanoplasty only happens. Now, tympano means eardrum. Plasty, which means a surgery, it's like plastic surgery, just think about that. They're repairing that hole. So what happens on the tympanoplasty is this. So if we have a hole, they're gonna take a flap of skin. This is so cool. The very first time I ever saw the tympanoplasty, I didn't fully understand it. What they sometimes do, now not on every case, but what they will do is they will cut around the back of the ear, it depends on uh, that depends on how bad the surgery is. But if it's a really big tympanoplasty, they will cut back the ear. They got to get into the space and they will drop a piece and they will take a piece of, of material from, from uh, it's like a muscly thing. And they will stretch it and stretch it as the surgery is going on. It's stretching itself out and they will lay it across that area and suture around. So it's a six, eight weeks before the ear, you really cannot go in swimming or any kind of thing that might cause you problems or go up in an airplane, you don't wanna have any of that. So the tympanoplasty, they'll pack it off and then after a few weeks, check your ear. But one of the things that we see as audiologists, one of the things that will happen is I'll look at an ear and I can see the scar tissue. Now scar tissue means that it was covered up or wh whether it healed itself or they had a tube and then that healed around it. <coughs> so it, it's fine. Then the other side will look really red. See, it's normally a grayish color, but it's very, very red and you can see a lot of blood vessels. That normally is a tympanoplasty. And I'll say, hey, if you had an ear surgery on this right side, yeah, how do you know? Because it looks like that. And so it, it is a great surgery. Did you know, by the way, and we're gonna end up with this little part. You see, ear infections were so bad in the previous time frames. I want you to think about basically 1940s and earlier. When ear infections would happen, they would stay in the middle ear and that, that fluid would, would get really gross. And then it would seep in to the meningeal layer. So go into the bone and go into the meningeal layer and that's your brain. When it would go into the brain, it would cause a high enough fever. You know, when you go up to 103, 104 and you see someone 
in that sick of a state, that's cooking the brain. And then they die from it. So people used to die of ear infections because we didn't have antibiotics. When the first penicillins came out in between World War I and World War II, when we had that penicillin, it made a big difference in the people. So one of the great areas is to have the penicillin that happened. But they also used in the 50s and 60s, they used to use something wacky. They used to use cigarette paper. Now cigarette paper actually has a striated kind of thing and they would lay it on there and kind of just hold it into place, you know, kind of gl slight glue and they would lay it in place and then they would take it off because the ear would, the, the, the uh, tympanic membrane or the eardrum would grow around it. So it would give it a place for it to move across and grow in. It was a, kind of a cool, unique way of doing that. Now, obviously when you had a really bad eardrum, you know, they didn't have much they could do. Now, sometimes they would try to do the earliest tympanic, uh, uh, tympanoplasties, but it wasn't very good. And you could have a lot of troubles with that. But frankly, from about the 90s and beyond, you know, tympanoplasties are very, very good. Now, any audiologist has been around for a while. You know, I started in the early 90s. I saw a lot of really gross tympanoplasties. It wasn't that they were bad. It just was done in the 70s or 60s. And they, they, had, they didn't have the techniques and the abilities they do today. So this is our first of our series, and we're going to talk next time about the ear bones, <coughs> which is otosclerosis and st stapendectomy and cholesteatomas. And we'll kind of give a little bit of a wrap up when we show that. So thank you so much. If you like what we did, push like, talk to us there, subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much.